Okay, so why would the world's biggest rocket, I mean, this absolute beast, deliberately fall sideways when it comes back to Earth? It just seems so wrong, doesn't it? Like uh, watching a building do a belly flop from space. But that really strange, almost chaotic looking descent, it's actually key. It's maybe the most important thing for making Starship reusable. You know, cheap, fast, reliable reuse. So for you, the listener, in this deep dive, we're going to unpack the really complex physics behind that whole flight path. We'll cover the, uh, the belly flop, the heat shield, those black tiles, and that nail-biting final vertical flip just before landing. We're digging into the sources to see exactly why the upcoming tests, like uh, Flight 11, are so focused on nailing these details, because getting these right unlocks the whole plan. Moon, Mars, everything. Before we dive in, a quick request. If you enjoy exploring books and ideas like this, hit the like button and share this video with your friends who love reading. Okay, let's unpack this. It really is a totally different way of thinking about rockets, isn't it? I mean, for decades, the thinking was point up on the way up, minimize drag point down on the way back, usually nose first. Starship just flips that complete. It's built so big and frankly so strong that it can use the atmosphere itself as the main break. That's the core idea, yeah. But it's still wild to picture. You're basically saying they're pushing this massive structure right to its aerodynamic limits just to save some fuel money. Why take that risk? Why point the big flat belly into the wind? Well, it boils down to two things. Surviving orbital speeds and your propellant budget. Yeah. You come in a super hot Mach 25. That's around, what, seven, 800 meters per second? Wow. Yeah. And that speed creates insane heat. If you try to slow down just using engines, you'll burn through all your landing fuel way too fast. Then your reuse plan is basically out the window. Too expensive, takes too long. Right. Okay. So the solution is use the air itself, maximize that aerodynamic drag. Don't burn fuel if you can get the atmosphere to do the work for you. So Starship spreads out like a skydiver. Exactly like a skydiver. Present free. the biggest possible surface area to the oncoming air. Yeah. And this belly flop maneuver, it's actually quite elegant engineering-wise. It does two critical jobs at the same time. First, it drastically cuts your terminal velocity. It slows the ship down from those crazy orbital speeds to uh, subsonic speeds, but it does it over a much longer period higher up. Second, it spreads out the heat load. That intense plasma thousands of degrees gets distributed across that enormous belly surface. Ah, instead of concentrating it. Precisely. If you tried to do this with a pointy nose cone, like older capsules, all that heat would focus on one tiny spot you'd melt right through, guaranteed structural failure. But it's not just falling like a brick, right? Those big flaps, the four of them, they're doing something important. Oh, absolutely essential. Oh. They're not just for steering like airplane wings. They let Starship actively control its lift and drag all the way down. It's constantly adjusting. It's not falling, it's flying its re-entry. It's actively managing its descent profile. Flying sideways. Flying sideways, yeah. Oh. And the economics here are fascinating. Think about it. Every single meter per second of speed you scrub off using air resistance. Is fuel you don't have to burn later for landing. Exactly. That tiny difference in fuel mass adds up. Mm. It's critical for the whole reuse model. Mm -hmm. If you save, say, 10% of your landing propellant because you braked effectively in the upper atmosphere, well, that's 10% more payload you can carry next time, or it means a faster turnaround. It all connects. I like the analogy of a cyclist. You know, going downhill fast, yeah. wants to slow down without hitting the brakes. Mm -hmm. You just sit bolt upright, make yourself as big a sail as possible, maximum drag. It's the same principle, just, you know, scaled up to a vehicle the size of a small skyscraper doing it at hypersonic speeds. Right. Okay, so the drag handles the speed problem, mostly. Oh, mostly, yeah. But you still have the heat. That friction with the air, even thin air, way up high, creates that superheated plasma. And that's where the famous black tiles come in, that sort of quilted pattern on the belly. Yep, those hexagonal heat shield tiles. They're the barrier protecting the stainless steel structure underneath. It's still just boggles my mind. We're talking Mach 25. That's like London to New York in under an hour. It's extreme. And they're trying to stop that massive thing using air resistance and basically ceramic bathroom tiles. Okay, advanced tiles, but still. Huh. Well, very, very advanced tiles. Think of them more like uh, super high-tech ceramic insulation. Mm -hmm. Lightweight, but incredibly good at stopping heat transfer. They use hexagons because that shape packs together really efficiently, and it handles the thermal expansion and contraction, well, those tiny gaps between tiles are crucial. The gaps are needed, but they're also the weak spot, right? We've seen that in previous flights. Exactly. It's usually not the tile material itself that fails first. It's the boundaries. The edges. The edges. The gaps between them, the seals, sometimes the fasteners holding them on. 
If that superheated plasma, which is hotter than the sun's surface, finds a way underneath the tiles. Bad news. Very bad news. Yeah. It doesn't just heat the steel hull. It can actually cause the underlying material, maybe foam insulation or even the steel itself, to oxidize. Oxidize meaning it burns or degrades. Degrades rapidly, yeah. Loses its structural integrity. And if the steel hull gets too hot, especially around where those big flaps attach, mm. well, you lose control. And we know SpaceX specifically mentioned improving the seals and looking at tile oxidation after Flight 10. Correct. That's a huge focus for Flight 11. Stress testing and really hardening that whole thermal protection system, the TPS. And this is where Starship has to be different from the space shuttle. How so? Shuttle tiles were amazing for their time, but notoriously fragile. They needed months of careful inspection and replacement between flights. Starship is aiming for aircraft-like operations, hours or days between flights, not months. So the TPS needs to be way more robust, tougher, faster to check, faster to fix if needed. Precisely. The tiles are sacrificial, in a way, like that camping mug analogy you mentioned earlier. The cork sleeve. Yeah. The boiling coffee is the plasma heat. The cork sleeve is the tile layer, keeping the metal mug, the structure, safe. Yeah. But it only works if that sleeve is intact, right? No gaps, no cracks, perfectly sealed edges. If one bit peels off, that boiling heat goes straight onto the metal. Got it. Okay, so we've got this giant rocket falling sideways, tiles hopefully doing their job, flaps controlling the fall. Here's where it gets really interesting, that last second flip. From horizontal belly flop to vertical engine down landing. Yeah, that's the moment of uh, controlled chaos. It has to happen really low. Just a few hundred meters up, typically. Why so late? Seems risky. The timing is absolutely critical. Flip too early, while you're still high up, you lose that massive drag profile. Oh, so you'd speed up again. You'd speed up, yeah. And then you'd need way more engine power, more fuel to stop yourself in time. Flip too late. Mm. Well, you pancake. You run out of altitude to break. And making that flip work under those forces requires perfect engine performance, right? The fuel has to get there instantly. Instantly and reliably. It's not just about having fuel in the tanks. It's about ensuring clean, bubble-free, liquid propellant hits those Raptor engines at full pressure right when they need it most during that high G flip. Which is where those little header tanks come in. Exactly. Deceptively simple, but utterly crucial. They're small, separate tanks, usually located high up in the vehicle. Okay. Their only job is to feed the landing engines during that final chaotic low altitude phase, the flip and the landing burn. But why? if the main tanks are still mostly full. Because the main tanks are huge. During that long belly flop descent, the propellant inside is sloshing all over the place, like crazy. Right. When the vehicle snaps vertical for the flip, that sloshing fuel could easily surge away from the main engine inlets for a crucial fraction of a second. You'd get bubbles, or what's called cavitation. Like an air bubble in a fuel line. Kills yeah. the engine. Pretty much. An engine stall right when you need maximum instant thrust to cancel out your remaining speed. The header tanks are small enough and positioned, so they guarantee a steady stream of bubble-free liquid right to the engines, no matter the G-forces or orientation. And we saw what happens when that goes wrong in the early high-altitude test down in Boca Chica. We certainly did. Those RUDs, rapid unscheduled disassemblies. Explosions. Explosions, yeah. Many of those are traced back to issues with propellant delivery during that flip. Header tank pressure problems, valve issues. It showed just how vital getting that system right is. They iterated, they fixed it, and eventually they nailed the landing. So mastering that whole sequence, the belly flop descent, the perfectly timed flip fueled by the header tanks, the clean engine relayed, and the soft landing. That's the key. That is the absolute key to unlocking the whole vision. If they can do that reliably every single time, then you get true aircraft-like operations. Fly, land, refuel, fly again. Maybe in days, eventually hours. That's how you crash the cost of getting to orbit. That's the only way. It's like that skydiver analogy again. Spread eagle for maximum drag, then tucking into feet first just before landing, mm -hmm. and then maybe a little burst from a jetpack right at the end to soften the touchdown. That's a pretty good way to picture it, yeah. A very precise final burn. Mm -hmm. So if we connect this to the bigger picture, what should you, the listener, really be watching for in Flight 11. Right, it's not the crazy stuff yet. Not the tower catch with the chopsticks. No, not yet. That's the future goal. Yeah. This flight is about nailing the fundamentals. It's about gathering really high quality re-entry data and proving they can control the splashdown precisely. Validate the systems under stress. Okay, so what are the specific test objectives we know about? Well, the profiles can change, 
but the plan generally involves the super heavy booster, the first stage doing its boost back burn, and then attempting engine relights for a controlled splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. So proving the booster can come back and fire its engines again. Yep. Survival and relight capability. But the ship, the Starship Upper Stage, has a much longer, more complex job. It's expected to deploy some test payloads, maybe dummy Starlinks, then perform an engine relight while it's still in space before re-entry starts. Oh, interesting. Why relight in space? That's a huge test. It validates restarting the Raptor engines after they've been sitting cold and dormant in the vacuum of space for a while. You need that for orbital maneuvering, for lunar missions, for Mars transits. Can the engines reliably restart after coasting? It's fundamental. Okay, so deploy payload, test restart in space, then the re-entry. Then the long guided re-entry, aiming for a splashdown zone way out in the Indian Ocean. So the things to watch for aren't necessarily spectacular explosions or catches. It's the boring stuff that matter. Yeah. Exactly. The quiet winds are actually the huge winds here. You want to see steady telemetry all through re-entry, no big signal dropouts. You want to see minimal tile loss when it splashes down or from any camera views they might have. Healthy flaps working correctly. Healthy flaps, definitely. Smooth control. And above all, a stable controlled flip maneuver followed by clean ignition and burn from those header tank fed engines right before splashdown. These are the things that actually prove the reuse concept is working. These are the engineering proof points. Yeah. And we know they can hit their targets. After Flight 10, SpaceX was clear they met objectives, including that precision splashdown. They know where it's going. Now it's about robustness through the whole reentry. And nailing these fundamentals, proving the system is reliable, that paves the way for the next steps. Pushing towards actually returning to the launch site, coming back to the tower. That's the path. Get these basics absolutely solid, then you can start attempting the pad returns and eventually the tower catch. Which leads to the cheaper launches, the faster turnaround, mm -hmm. and enabling those really ambitious missions needing lots of launches. So what does this all mean? We started asking why on earth it falls sideways. And now we see that uh, every single piece of this weird re-entry plan, the aerodynamics, the tiles, the fuel tanks, the flip, it's all meticulously engineered for one goal. Operational stability and repeatability, making spaceflight reliable and frequent. So the belly flop gives you the drag you need. The tiles handle the incredible heat, though they're still iterating on the system's weak points. And the final flip, powered by those header tanks, gives you the landing precision. Those are the pillars, yeah. The pillars of rapid, full reusability. And this capability, this giant reusable rocket. It's, it's not just cool engineering. It's meant to slash the cost of putting anything in orbit. Right. Which helps deploy Starlink faster, obviously. But it's also fundamental to NASA's plans for the moon with Artemis. Starship is the lunar lander. It underpins so much of the future roadmap for space activity, yes. Yeah. High volume, lower cost. And that stability point is key. If Starship just performs all these incredibly difficult maneuvers successfully on Flight 11, if the whole thing looks, yeah, well, uneventful. That's actually a massive success. That's historic. Because uneventful, in this context, means reliable. And reliability is what finally makes spaceflight routine. Making spaceflight routine. Yeah, that's the dream. Which leads me to a final thought, something for you to chew on. If this current system, you know, stainless steel and these ceramic tiles, proves the concept of rapid reuse works, what comes next? What kind of new material or maybe a totally different structural design is needed to get to truly guaranteed aircraft-like simplicity for orbital re-entry? What replaces the tile and the steel hull to make the turnaround time measured in just hours reliably every time? Something to think about. Thanks for diving deep with us today. We'll catch you on the next one.